Good morning. Today we are going to discuss Soul Gone Home, which is a one act play by Langston Hughes. Uh, by one act play, we mean plays that are very short, uh, which are limited to just one act. Uh, very uh, Usually these plays are limited to just one scene, where you have very few characters and there is an interaction. So the drama builds up, uh, the dramatic action builds up and it reaches a climax and uh, resolves itself all in the space of these uh, the few uh, probably a one hour maximum of one or one and a half hours of uh, acting time <clears throat> so this is uh, this was a, this became a very popular uh, form of uh, dramatic performance during the early 20th century because first of all uh, you did not need that much time to uh, perform a one act play uh, the audience could uh, enjoy it much more if it was not that prolonged uh, and also because it was very easy to make uh, concise statements about especially politically and socially relevant issues through through the use of one act plays so the play we have here is soul gone home uh, a one act play by langston hughes and langston hughes was an african american writer before we go into the play in itself uh, we'll discuss a little bit about uh, Langston Hughes first. <coughs> uh, Langston Hughes is not his full name. He was born as uh, James Mercer Langston Hughes. He adopted the uh, name Langston Hughes when he started uh, writing, when he became a writer. So uh, he was born in 1902 May and he died in, uh, sorry, 1902 February and he died in May 1967. So you can see that he had a very long life and uh, almost all through this life he was very productive, especially uh, in terms of literature, in, in terms of his productivity in literature, creative productivity. Uh, now, he is also one of the first African American writers to um, gain due recognition for the work that he did. It is not that there were no black writers before Hughes, there were. Uh, it was not that there were no black writers after Hughes, yes. But Hughes belongs to that generation of writers, artists and musicians who uh, gained legitimate recognition, legitimate acceptance as uh, artists and creators uh, for the first time in a mainstream way. So again, he is associated with uh, the Harlem Renaissance movement. Harlem Renaissance movement, uh, it happened in 1920s, uh, 1920s, 1930s, so on. Uh, it was located, it was, uh, it had its nerve center in Harlem, which is a borough in New York. Uh, it was mostly an African American uh, community at the time and uh, this place became the nerve center of African American art, culture, literature, uh, theatrical productions and most importantly music. So this became a nerve center for everything uh, African American that was happening at the time. <coughs> but at the time Harlem Renaissance was not called Harlem Renaissance, it was called uh, the New Negro Movement. Uh, then at that time the use of the use of the term Negro was acceptable today it is not uh, it is considered offensive today so the new Negro movement uh, when you think about how the movement came about you have people like uh, Hubert Harrison uh, and uh, Alain Locke Alain Locke's 1925 uh, anthology is titled new Negro movement uh, so you have uh, people like that who worked for uh, race conscious class conscious uh, political and civil rights movement which uh, demanded that segregation be ended which demanded that physical abuse of physical abuse and torture of african american people in the form of lynching and such other activities be ended uh, as you know segregation is a state sponsored way in which uh, african uh, african and uh, european descent people in america were separated in buses in restaurants in schools there were separate schools for black and white children so this was a state sponsored method especially in the american south and people started asking that these things be abolished if you are going to have an egalitarian society these things cannot exist uh, there was also uh, this idea that armed self-defense of african-american communities is perfectly acceptable in whenever they are uh, subjected to perpetual uh, per, when they are perpetrated uh, violence upon them when violence is perpetrated upon them so this kind of uh, an idea was there in the new negro movement which later today which is known as uh, harlem renaissance now langston hughes one of the most recognizable personalities associated with the harlem renaissance movement arthur p davis calls hughes the poet laureate of uh, harlem renaissance he was the most important poet of the time uh, to 
say something about uh, Hughes's background. <coughs> uh, his, he has mixed ethnicity. His family, uh, he has ancestors, both Native American and uh, African American, of course. Uh, but also he has uh, some European descent in his family. His father's family was extremely political. Uh, they were political activists, even from the time of uh, abolition, which is the abolition of slavery. They were abolitionists. So in that sense, maybe uh, his political activism came to Langston Hughes through this area. So this we, we must understand before we go into Hughes that he was not just a writer. Uh, he's known today mostly for his poetry, but he was not just a poet. He was not just a novelist, just a dramatist. No, that is not who he was. He was also a social activist. About his uh, political activism or social activism, uh, Susan Duffy says that he is more of a political idealist rather than a political ideologue, uh, which means that Hughes never associated himself formally uh, with any uh, political party, left-leaning party or right-leaning party. He was never associated with any kind of political party, but at the same time, he had a kind of political idealism uh, for the uh, future of African Americans that was there. So. In his writings, it is the same idealism that we can see, <coughs> idealism reflected, but it is also realistic in the sense that he portrays the uh, very stark realities of black life, sometimes realistically, sometimes very imaginatively. Now, he started his career, in his literary career, or he decided that he would become a writer or would settle into a literary career when he first gained success as a poet. His early poetry, which came out during the 1920s, remember he was only uh, in his teen at the time or he's in his early 20s. Uh, and it was the time that his first poetry, poetical collections came out and people appreciated it very much. And this uh, appreciation that he got uh, made him choose literature as a career. Now, this was a very bold move at the time because um, literature as a career, it was not a well thought out plan, I must say, because even white people could not uh, start of a literary career and have a steady life in the time. And here was an African American man deciding that, yes, I'm going to be a writer and that is who I'm going to be. Uh, this was a time when a white, uh, white people would probably not even read what black people wrote. So this was a very bold decision on Langston Hughes's part. Uh, however, in the 1930s, he was forced to turn from uh, poetry to prose and drama because he was supporting himself through his writing. He used to write in several journals and publications uh, as a professional writer, prose pieces. And this was what uh, he at no point of time was he very comfortable financially. So this is how he uh, supported himself. And he also turned to drama. Now, you might wonder what uh, brought him to drama, what in made him so interested in drama. Uh, it was not just the money part or the performance aspect of it. Uh, it was a kind of an interest that came very early in childhood. Uh, there is, it, has been, it has been said that he was uh, brought into the dramatic world by his mother. His mother had aspirations of becoming an actress herself. So she used to do these dramatic recitations for the young Hughes and he used to listen to it. That must have been one reason for inspiration. And another being that she used to take him on these trips to Kansas, Kansas where theatrical performances were held. And uh, she would uh, take the boy and go to watch these theatrical performances. And that must also have uh, made him interested in uh, drama in the first place. And this is where uh, he started this association, this lifelong association with the Karamu Theatre Company, which was also associated with Karama House. Uh, if you read about the history of the play that we are dealing with here, Soul Gone Home, you'll understand that uh, it was first staged by Karamu Theatre Company. We don't know who the actors were. We don't have exact recordings of it, but uh, we do know that it was first performed by the Karamu Theatre Company. But uh, Hughes was very passionate about plays. He wrote a lot of plays, but uh, sometimes, as you know, it is one thing to write a play, but to get a production on stage, uh, spend that much money on a theatrical production, uh, this may not always be feasible. Uh, you may not find producers who are willing to put up your plays. So uh, Hughes was not deterred by this at all. He did not care about whether he had money or not. He was so passionate about theatres that he went ahead and formed theatre companies of his own. Uh, some of these include Harlem Suitcase Theatre, uh, 
Los Angeles Negro Art Theatre, Skyloft Players, which was established in Chicago, and of course, he associated with the Karamu Theatre Company also. The first three uh, he established at different uh, periods of time in his life in order to stage his own plays, and the last one uh, was established by others along with the Karamu House and this company with uh, whom he associated for a very long time. Uh, now, by the end of his career, Mm, which is in 1967, it, until the time he died, he was uh, active very much in literature. So by the end of his career, with his death in 1967, Langston Hughes had written 40 plays. Uh, it's now mean feat. He wrote 40 plays. And this is only plays that he, this is only the number of plays that he wrote on his own. There are also other plays uh, which were written in collaboration with other artists. Around 23 plays are collaborations with other artists. Now, uh, you have the most important plays that we can identify, <coughs> uh, which are often mentioned in connection with Hughes is Mulebone. Mulebone was written in collaboration with Zora Neale Hurston. Um, there was a little controversy about the ownership of who wrote the play and all that, but uh, finally it has been, uh, now it is acknowledged as having been written by both Langston Hughes and Hurston. Then there is Simply Heavenly, Mulatto, Little Ham and Black Nativity. These are the plays that we usually think about when we think about Langston Hughes as a uh, playwright. Now these are his most well-known plays. <coughs> Now let's come to the play at hand, which is Soul Gone Home. Uh, the play was published in 1937 in the July issue of One Act Play magazine. There was a magazine uh, which serialized uh, or which published um, plays that were limited to a single act. And it was a very popular uh, trend at the time. And Soul Gone Home was published in 1937. Uh, again. How did the play come about? Uh, as I said, Langston Hughes, uh, during this period, 1937, it is almost the end of uh, the 1930s. Uh, he has been experimenting for some time with different kinds of uh, literary forms. So when it came to drama, he was told by uh, the director of Karamu Theatre Company, Rowena Jalif, that uh, this was time that he started writing, getting serious about plays. Oh, uh, th it was time that he started writing serious plays, that this was very important. So Langston Hughes took the advice and he was doing a lot of experimental writing at the time, which he infused into this play, Soul Gone Home. And this is reflected in the play because uh, you can see a lot of surreal elements there in the play. For example, the simple fact that the play, um, you might have read the play, the play is based on um, a scene where a mother is uh, wailing or crying or mourning over her son who is dead and then uh, the boy starts speaking to the mother and the mother and the boy have uh, an argument about who did what and what went wrong and all those things it is actually a blame game they're blaming each other throughout the uh, throughout the play now the interesting thing about the thing is think about it the setting itself is surreal it is super real uh, it is not exactly realistic. For some reason, Langston Hughes felt that it was not possible to portray the harsh reality, the stark reality of African-American poverty and African-American life and the absurdity of it in any manner which was realistic. If he followed realism, he would not be able to have a dramatic impact. In order to create that impact, it was necessary to resort to surrealism. Hence, you see a mother arguing with her dead son in the play. Now, uh, the play goes beyond the limitations of reality and realism. You can see that. So it plays with the concept of what is real, what is real and what is not. When you're watching the play you'll, or you're reading the play, you'll, you'll have this doubt. You'll be a little uh, incredulous about what is happening. Is this real? Is this not real? Is this conversation really happening? This is what you will be thinking. So it plays with the concept of what is real in order to expose the ironies of black American life. You see a lot of instances of irony in this play. The play was also made into an opera and it was first performed in 1957. The analysis of the play that I am offering here, much of it has been based on Joseph McLaren's interpret, uh, interpretation of the play, which has been, uh, he has interpreted different plays written by Hughes and uh, he has also dealt with Soul Gone Home. I have uh, depended heavily on McLaren's interpretation in order to uh, discuss 
soul gone home with you today. So uh, let's look at the play in itself. Now soul gone home, it seems like a very uh, strange title. Uh, soul gone home is, seems like a phrase which is incomplete, which does not give you a complete sense of what is going on. It is clear that there is a soul and the soul has gone home. What is home? Where does a soul go when it is going home? See, our body, uh, when we think in spiritual terms, our body means nothing. This body is just a place, a house where you place your soul. This is just a place for uh, the soul to live in. So when the soul, uh, for the soul it is the end of the time, it will move on. It will move on to its real home. <coughs> and this real home is of course heaven. So this is a reference to of course the Christian faith where death is seen as the point at which the soul of a person returns to its real home. And this real home is the spiritual world or heaven. Here, <coughs> excuse me, here the character refers to this uh, spiritual world as spirit world. That is how the mother refers to this term. Now, if you go through the entire play, you will see that here Langston Hughes really does not make any kind of overt uh, social critique. Obviously, the play is a criticism of uh, how the black American society lives or the deprivation and the poverty. But nowhere in the play can you actually see either the mother or the son saying something against the white oppressors or the people who are outside who have put them in a certain kind of situation. You don't even see any kind of a valid critique from their side. So this is one of the rare plays of Hughes where there is no overt social criticism that is seen. Rather, how do you get to know about the stark reality of black life? It is not through the criticism offered by the characters, but it is impressed upon us through the setting of the play. Even as we start the play, we can see that the setting is very drab. There are not many items or articles present in the room. The setting is what we call minimalist. There is only a minimum of things around. From the setting, the setting goes like this, a night, a tenement room, bare, ugly, dirty, an unshaded light pulp. This is the setting that you have in front of you. And from this we can understand that this is a very, it is a probably not a very rich household, not just probably, it is definitely not a rich household. It, is some kind of a deprived situation that you see in front of you. So uh, there have been opinion that from the circumstances that are given there, we can surmise, we can assume that it is a family, a black family home which is located in a deprived urban community, possibly in Northern America. In Northern America, there were so many different areas where or housing projects, they are called projects, where uh, black families were given homes. And these buildings were not properly maintained. Uh, these services offered in these buildings were very uh, few. They were not uh, properly, uh, may, as I said, maintained or taken care of. And the uh, uh, basic services were not available all the time, which meant that these people, uh, amid the prosperity that is outside in the US, these people in the projects, uh, which later came to be known as ghettos, in these places, people lived in abject uh, penury. They did not have access to any kind of services at the time. So from the setting we can see that this is one such place. Uh, William Miles, a critic, has said that uh, this play expresses the black isolation from the white world outside. So the white world outside is a world that is run by white men and then you have the inside of the house uh, where the presence is absolutely African American. Uh, there is no prosperity, only poverty. Now, the picture of poverty painted by the minimalist setting suggests that there is a distancing from the prosperous white world outside. Mm -hmm. So, you see, when you think about the US, I'm sure when you think about the US, you do not think of uh, this squalor. You know that Langston Hughes is an American playwright. You are reading his play. Uh, you are preparing to read his play and uh, you know that the setting is in the US. So there is no way that you will assume that it is possible this kind of poverty is present there. So what the author is trying to do here is to tell you that the prosperity is not exactly 
available everywhere or the prosperity is not uh, omnipresent. The prosperity of the United States of America is somehow in the hands of only a very few people and the rest of the society, especially racial minorities live in squalor and their life, their morals, their manners, their lifestyle, uh, their concepts about different things, these are all very different and they are different because they are controlled by poverty, nothing else. So, there is this isolation from between the uh, black people and the white people and this isolation is very uh, expertly presented in the play. Now, uh, this deprivation, the setting is a tenement. What is a tenement? A tenement is a place, one of these housing projects that I spoke about. A tenement is basically a, a residence where several families live together, probably what we conceive of as a, a housing project like a flat in different floors. And these tenements, uh, what is peculiar about them is that usually people of the same uh, economic and social background live together. So here the tenement, the word tenement, when you say tenement rather than residence or a flat or an apartment, what you mean is that the people who live there are economically deprived and socially they are the underclass. So the same thing that separate, the same word tenement that separates the setting from the white world outside also connects, makes a connection to the rest of the black uh, life or the black uh, common life in uh, the Americas, <coughs> America, in the US. Now, thus the play setting ensures that the narrative is distant from white prosperity and aligned with black poverty. Black connection, how do you see the black connection? You can see the black connection in the tenement room. In the tenement room that you see there, as I said, it is actually a marker for the kind of urban housing that was offered to African American people at the time. Uh, we are t uh, speaking about the time 1930s. Again, there is poverty, which you can see in the bare furnishings. There is just a coat uh, in the uh, room. There is nothing else. There are no uh, gaudy furnitures. I mean, not even the basic necessities that you see in a home is actually visible there. Then we come to the question of the absent father. Now, this is a very important question. We don't see a father in the situation. We just see. Uh, we just see just the mother and the son with no father. You might be curious, where is the father? Again, when you read the play, you will come to it. Now, this absent father syndrome, excuse me. This absent father syndrome was um, not a new thing in African-American society. It was very prevalent. Some uh, social critics actually attribute it to the years of slavery. When African men were brought from Africa, uh, to the Americas, they were actually torn of their, shown of their humanity. They were no longer considered human. They started being considered as property, as slaves. This meant that when you take a typical plantation in the American South, a man or a woman, well, they could get married. I'm talking about slaves. They could get married, it was possible, but uh, they did not have the same kind of familial relations that ordinary people have in the sense that usually when a man and a woman get married it is assumed that they have a conjugal life together and that they are not available for uh, sexual I don't know escapades outside of the particular marriage situation. It is assumed that a married woman must not be pursued by other men this is the assumption. However, when you are a slave and a married woman it makes no difference. The husband is there just for show. Any time a plantation owner prefers to have sex with his uh, African slave, he can go ahead and do it. Now, we can see parallels of the same thing happening in our country among the scheduled caste communities where uh, women were subjected to sexual abuse by well, whom we call the Jenmis or landlords for a very long time and nobody could question it. There was no question of questioning it because these people were not even considered human. In a similar way, slaves had no such rights. So, African men who were brought to America who had been living as slaves for a very long time, it is said that they developed a syndrome whereby they find it impossible to uh, be in a familial situation, be in a, be a father or a husband or 
be a brother and do the duties that are expected of him for example protecting his uh, the female members of his family or providing for the family well, such things were completely beaten out of them as slaves so therefore it is said that african men have a problem or black men in america have a problem staying in their families marrying a woman and staying with her or uh, you know finding a girlfriend and staying with them building a family because they are always afraid that even if they build it they cannot sustain it because of the forces from outside so this is one of the critiques that have been raised it may or may not be true but here also we have the same syndrome of the absent father later in the play you will see ronnie's mother speak about how this man ruined her and ronnie was the result that is what she says so this woman who had a relation it is obvious that she had a relationship with the man and that she got pregnant but nobody was willing to uh, offer her help least of all this man who got her pregnant she says that she was ruined probably this is a reference to the fact that he refused to marry her and that he left so when he left that is it this is a single woman uh, we are talking about the 1920s uh, or even 1910s 15 16 that period and this woman is trying to raise a child on her own it is not at all a very conducive situation so you have the absent father syndrome which is Uh, a part of uh, many uh, deprived uh, african american economically and socially backward communities that is the absent father this is another thing that makes the black connection with the outside world again there is the exploitation and the abandonment of women as i have already said <clears throat> at that period the 1920s and 1930s jobs were very hard to come by and especially for a single black african woman you cannot just walk into a store and ask for a job chances are you won't get it also there is no proper skill training proper education there are such opportunities were so limited that there is no way that a black woman can actually make it in life even today these situations do prevail there are there is a lot of racial profiling which makes it impossible for black women to come forward sometimes unless they already have such a background unless they were already born into middle class or upper middle class for lower middle class black women it is very hard to become economically independent even today so imagine what it must have been like in 1920s or 30s so when a woman becomes pregnant for the next 10 months 9 months she is losing her ability to earn for herself support herself in the absence of any kind of support system social support system social security or any kind of such measures from the state a single woman cannot really survive at the same time her, she has been abandoned her, by her own community perhaps her uh, husband or boyfriend or uh, the partner that she had has left her so she this kind of an emotional distancing exploitation and abandonment of women is another theme that you can see in the play there is also economic hardship lack of employment opportunities as we have seen then what really makes you see the black connection the immediate effect that you get is the uh, diction of the play the play uses a lot of you can see a lot of ungrammatical sentences there the way the, the play is written the way african american people speak or they spoke at the time uh, from the dialogues we can see that these are not very educated people or these are not people who have tried to um, modulate their uh, speech Uh, patterns through the grammar of a, a white society they haven't tried to refine their language so what we see here is how people speak normally again this is the greatest connection to the black culture because we get an immediate impact of how people speak in that uh, in that particular at that particular time and in that particular social class so we have uh, expressions like let me which means let me and it ain't uh, it is not is it as it ain't there is use how is you that that in itself is an ungrammatical usage double negatives multiple negatives using no everywhere again alternative verb conjugations verbs are conjugated in a way that you have not seen before and uh, for example the usage of the word ruined the ruined is something that the woman is coming up with herself or it is part of her dialect so these are the things tenement rooms which is a physical setting the poverty bare furnishings the absent father the exploitation of women the economic hardship and most importantly most immediately the vernacular expressions these are the things that establish the black connection to the world now we have seen that the setting of the play is an impoverished urban black household somewhere in northern united states this is the setting so the rest of the things that you see is that is that there is a 
very young man probably a boy even a boy he is only 16 years old as is revealed later he is lying on a he is laid out it is the body of a man it is laid out on a uh, coat uh, and there are pennies on his eyes now uh, it is a very curious uh, thing because the woman when she cries the mother who is sitting beside the child when she cries she says god and lord and all that uh, obviously the appeal is to the christian god but and the interesting thing is that she puts pennies on her son's eyes which is a reference to a certain folk religious belief uh, where i i'm sure this is a story familiar to you uh, in pagan belief especially in greek and roman mythology it is assumed that when a soul dies or when a man dies his soul which is transported to the underworld uh, from this world it goes to the next world to the underworld by crossing a river the name of the river varies from uh, one mythology to the next so when this river has to be crossed there is a boatman who will take the soul to the next uh, to the other side in order to do that the boatman has to be paid uh, he has to be paid something so when a person dies pennies are placed on his eyes so that the boatman can take these pennies as the prize for the soul's passage into the next world so this is a folk belief that is carried on from the pagan times and the mother really believes that this is true so she even in at the in end of the play you can see that when the undertakers come when the people from the city service come and they have to uh, really get the body going and she says oh my god go lie down i am looking for the pennies where are the pennies i have to put pennies on your eyes because if i don't put pennies on your eyes you might not be able to make the passage to the other side so the pennies imply that the mother has a faith in folk spirituality where it is believed that the pennies are for the boatman that will transport the boy's soul so in some ways you can see that the mother is very considerate on other terms you can see that she is not because uh, according to the boy she is the reason why he is dead so the mother is kind of if you read the description of the mother you can see that she is uh, portrayed rather unsympathetically in a traditional sense in a very real sense or in a very straightforward sense a child is dead the mother sits beside probably crying hysterically uh, beating her chest uh, you know pulling out her hair this is normal this is natural because the son has died the grief is not something that you simulate but here the term used by the playwright is simulated grief the woman is crying in simulated grief and you will also feel the same way because the woman seems a little too enthusiastic about her son's death the way she screams is a little uh, it it is rather odd it is as if she is putting on a performance and you start wondering why would a mother put on a performance when she is watching her son's dead body when she is uh, waiting for someone to come and take away the dead body another thing that you immediately notice is that a uh, child is dead the woman is the only person sitting uh, beside him and uh, mourning him there is nobody else even in the worst places uh, if somebody dies you find someone from the neighborhood there i mean a lot of people from the neighborhood there people from here and there somebody would appear and mourn we be a part of the mourning but this mother and this son are utterly alone the child is dead and the mother is there alone and she is grieving so obviously the grief that the mother has is going to be a different kind of grief it is not the kind of grief that will come out of a mother who has had a support system in bringing up a child so when hughes portrays her it is quite an unsympathetic portrayal we can see that and we also see that she is wearing a red sweater uh, which seems odd because she is uh, ready she is she has already uh, placed pennies on her son's eyes she's very concerned about that but she's not wearing the traditional black mourning anything I mean, she's not wearing a black black dress at all she's wearing red which seems very odd in a setting of a funeral <clears throat> so again this is uh, this kind of a grief that she's showing is this is actually described as being insincere and this sorrow is not at all sincere that is the impression that the uh, playwright wants to give when we start off so her loud appeals you can see here the mother says oh god oh lord why did you take my son from me and then she says oh son oh ronny oh my boy speak to me ronny say something to me so it is like even though she is talking to god she is also speaking to her son she wants her son to wake up more than she is uh, sending her appeals to god so it is a very weird situation and when you read it you can understand that the way the woman expresses things uh, oh ronny oh my boy speak to me Ronnie says something to me son why don't you talk to your mother 
Can't you see she's bowed down in sorrow? Son, speak to me just one word. Come back from the spirit world and speak to me, Rani. Come back from the dead and speak to your mother. And this is the uh, speech that goes on. So she says that. And you can see that the grief seems rather put on. It is not really real. That is the feeling that we get. And uh, we say that the, the tone of the play throughout is rather, it is a serious tone. It is a serious play. It seems like a serious play. But there is so much play on words. There is so much play on the irony of the situation that it is also humorous. It is humorous in a very macabre way. It is humorous in a very weird and black humor kind of way. It is not a very straightforward kind of happy joy kind of mood. So what you see is the mother is crying in grief and the son suddenly gets up and uh, he's lying there dead. No, he doesn't get up. He's lying there dead as a doornail, says the playwright. And he says, I wish I wasn't dead so I could speak to you. And then he says, you've been a hell of a mama. So that is his response. So the boy is so irritated by this woman's simulated grief that he comes back from dead and he says, you are a no good mama. You have never been a good mother. Now then the play goes on. As the play goes on, you see uh, the, there is a complete contradiction between uh, the way the mother thinks about how she has cared for her child and how the boy perceives of, her mother's, uh, of his mother's care. Uh, she says that she's, she's wild eyed. She's actually very surprised to see that. She says, is you done open your mouth and spoke to me? What you said? What did you say? I said you are hell of a mama. He keeps reiterating that she's not a good mother at all. Oh, Ronnie, that ain't you talking. So she gets scared for a second. You know, uh, this dead son is speaking. No, it, it, it is not you talking. It is interesting that the mother says that it is not he talking. Because think about it, the play is surrealistic. You know that a dead person cannot come back from uh, the spirit world. But the woman is hearing her son say certain things. And uh, somewhere in between she also says that you never spoke like this before. You never spoke like this when you were alive. And the boy says, well, I can speak any which way I like now because I'm not dead anymore. You know, I I'm dead now and I I'm not alive anymore. I don't have to be afraid of anything. So look at the situation. Do you really think that the boy is coming back from the dead to speak to his mother? And she's asking, this is not you speaking. Who is speaking really? Who is this person that is accusing uh, the woman of being uh, a negligent mother, of having been a negligent mother? It is probably her own guilt. So this is why the mother is a very complicated, complex character. This is not the son speaking. It is the mother's guilt at not having been there for him. It is the mother's guilt at not having provided for him. So everything, if you think in those terms, everything that is said here, you can say that the son is not saying it. It is the mother's own guilt that is uh, saying all these things to herself. In those terms, if you look at the play, you can see that it is the mother speaking to herself after she has very nearly killed her son. And the circumstances of the son being dead, it is like it is much like a conversation inside her head, inside your head you might have. After you have done something terrible, you think about it and then you try to justify yourself and you try to crucify yourself. Both these things come together. It is that kind of a conversation that you can see here. Now, she asked very innocently many times, what do you mean? I ain't done you right. I haven't done anything for you. You're saying that I did not do right by you. I did not treat you properly. What do you mean that, by that? On several occasions, you see that there is this complete mutual incomprehension between these two people. The boy says that you are guilty because you gave birth to me. Yes, you brought me into this world. True. But then you did not provide for me. You did not feed me. You did not clothe me. All you did was send me out into the cold to sell papers, even when I was not uh, physically well to do it. This is his argument. On the other side, the mother says that. Well, it is all your fault. You know, you have always been a burden to me. You have been no use to me. You know, you are a boy. I mean, you are a man. You, were, you would have become a man and you could have helped out your mother. But instead, what did you do? You went and died. You went and died when you were only 16. And now I have nobody. Who is going to take care of me? That is the mother's question. The son is flabbergasted by this. You know, you brought me into this world and you never fed me. And so there is these arguments that keep going on. Son says that you never did feed me good. That's what I mean. 
who wants to come into the world hungry and go out the same way? So I, I don't want to. I mean, who wants to be hungry all the time, even if they have a life? What do you mean hungry? This is the mother's response. When I had money, ain't I fed you? So if she has money, she definitely feeds him. So the point that she does not have money is not really her fault. That is her argument. And in some ways it is true because if the woman does not have work and if the woman does not have money, it is perhaps not really her fault. It is perhaps not really because she is lazy. As you can see at the end of the play, the woman goes back to the body is gone and the woman gets up, she puts on her makeup, she puts on her coat and she goes out to prostitute herself, to sell her body. She does not, it, it, she does not even wait a few minutes and mourn her son before doing it. Is she doing it for pleasure? Certainly not. She is doing it because she has no choice. So the point that she did not have any money, that is not really her fault. That is what the mother seems to claim. But the son on the other hand keeps insisting that the fact that the mother had no money was not, not a fault of his either. It was my fault, it wasn't your fault. So whose fault it is? Who, whose fault is it? That is the question. So mother says that you never was used to me and then the son says, this is where the element of macabre humor comes in. So you just let me grow up in the street and I ain't had no manners, no morals neither. That is what he says. I did not have any manners and morals. So the mother's response to this is curious. She said, oh my God, where did you learn these words from, these big words from? So as far as the woman is concerned, the question of morals, manners, she does not believe that these form a part of parenting, these form a part of raising a child. Somehow she has no idea uh, that this has to be there. How did you learn these big words? Now the boy says, oh, I just learned them in the spirit world. Oh, she, you have been there only a few minutes and you've already learned it. I mean, he says, you know, you can learn a lot of things in a very less amount of time that is possible. So this woman is being accused of not just not feeding her child, but also of not giving her adequate, giving him adequate morals and manners and training him in uh, this kind of thing. So in, in the way he should be living his life, what is good, what is uh, bad or what is wrong, what is right. None of these lessons were taught to him. So this is like, again a play on the macabre, uh, macabre humor because uh, look at it. The woman is uh, unaware of morals and manners and it seems that this whole moral and manner situation comes from the spirit world and the spirit world is dominated by the white people because well they are the ones who decide what is right and what is wrong. So she has no concept, she has no idea of what it means to have manners and morals. Again, you can see that the, uh, again this uh, thing keeps happening that she, she seems surprised that her son is dead and she seems unaware of the fact of uh, how, she, how he died, what is the reason for his death. So the boy is angry, he says you don't remember, you don't remember the doctor telling that I have TB and I must have milk and eggs. You know, I must have milk and eggs, that's how I, I should be, you know, saved. But uh, she says that, you know, she, she's not aware, it, she seems, or she pretends that uh, she does not know about this, mm -hmm. that she did not give milk and eggs to the child. So the boy says that I died of undernourishment and she says, what? Undernursement. So such uh, plays on words again, that the, the woman does not understand concepts like undernourishment and she's just shutting it out. No, I mean, I don't know. I, this is not something I'm familiar with. So if I don't know what it is, then I don't have to, uh, you know, do it for you. Again, the boy says that if I'm lying, I'm dying, which is a, you know, like a common usage that, you know, if I'm uh, settling for a second, then probably because I'm dead because I work so hard. It can also mean that, let's say that I'm lying, I'm going to die right now. If I'm lying, let me die. But the boy is already dead. So again, a play on macabre humor. There is a beautiful passage there where he said, the doctor said I was dying of undernourishment. That's what he said. He said I had TB because I didn't have enough to eat, never when I was a child. And he said I couldn't get well. No how eating nothing but beans ever since I've been sick. Said I needed milk and eggs. And you said he ain't got money for milk and eggs, which I know you ain't. We never had no money, Mama, not even since you took to hustling on the streets. So the boy says that, you know, I don't know why you are talking about money. You know, there is no money. There's never been any money. Son, money ain't everything. Nah, but when you got TB, you have to have milk and eggs. Anyhow, I love you, Ronnie. Sure, you love me, but here I'm dead. 
So this is the kind of play that goes on. Of course, you love me. You say that you love me, but I am dead. How come I am dead when you say that you are loving me? You have always loved me. When a mother loves a son, does she allow her son to die? So this is the argument that goes on. So she, he, she says that, uh, you know, I have cried, I have cried for you. The boy says, I don't think you've ever cried for me, you know. This is the only time I've seen you cry for me. And she says, dang, you're a liar. I cried when I bound you. You were such a big child, you were 10 pounds. And the son's reply is, then I did the crying after that, I reckon. So yeah, okay, fine. When you gave birth to me, you cried. But then after that, all the crying was from my part. So again, the, when the woman starts speaking about how Ronnie was born, she says that she was ruined. She sees Ronnie as a burden, this burden that is around her neck, uh, the burden from which she cannot escape. Now, think about it. When she speaks about how she had the child, uh, she says that your father ruined me and used the result. And I've been worried with you for 16 years. So the thing is, I was pregnant. How could I do anything? I mean, there is nothing to be done. I mean, uh, she says that once I got pregnant, I did not have choices. Again, this is a reference to the fact that there were no uh, reproductive choices available to women at the time. She could not just go to a very safe clinic and have an abortion. That was not a choice at the time. She got pregnant. The only choice in front of her was to get married to the man who got her pregnant and have a family life. But this man abandoned her. So then she has to look for other men who will fulfill that position because it is very hard to be a single woman uh, with a child on her own. But she says that again, Ronnie is the one who is standing between her and her bright future. This child has impeded every single prospect that she had because no man wants to raise another uh, man's child. So this woman sees Ronnie as a burden on one side. At the same time, you can see that she was a very kind mother who whenever she had money, gave it to the child, made sure that the child had something to eat. At the same time, she didn't, could not make much money. She is also the kind of mother who, re, who, when she realized that the son is sick, a sickly child, he's undernourished, he cannot really earn much money selling papers, going out like other boys. Uh, she is the kind of woman who decided that she's going to prostitute herself, hence the term, hustling in the streets. So she's the woman who decided that she's going to prostitute herself in order to provide for the son. So in the play, we can see that Ronnie, for Ronnie, he does not understand his mother's limitations. He does not see the sexual exploitation to which a single black woman with a child uh, to support is subjected in the society of the time. And he does not see the power structures outside. He does not make any references to who has put his mother in a situation like this. He doesn't mention it. Similarly, the mother, rather than apologizing to her son uh, for the neglect, she sees him as an ungrateful child who never helped her out, curiously enough. Uh, the mother is both selfish, portrayed as selfish, seeing her son as a burden, and she's also racked with immense guilt and a sense of loss. The guilt speaking to her is uh, Ronnie's voice. And there is also a great sense of loss. So there are contradictory emotions that are attributed to the mother in this play. So we can say that the mother is rather a rather un ambivalent character. So we see in this play that we can, uh, there, are, there are certain themes that we can see in this play. The first thing being the realities of a single parent family, uh, especially a family in a racial minority. There is the failure to identify the real culprit. Uh, who is the person that puts a woman in the situation? Let's say that a woman gets pregnant. Uh, should, shouldn't there be some kind of a government service, a state a sponsored service that will give her access to either proper uh, confinement or proper abortion services. These are all things that could have been made available. Or uh, if she chooses to have a child, some kind of support to a single mother. Again, we see blaming each other. There is a lot of blaming between the mother and the child. There is no communication at all. So we see that uh, throughout the play, the mother has certain expectations, the son has certain expectations, and their expectations never meet. They are bickering. After the child's death, they are bickering. They are arguing with each other. This is what we see. And then, towards the end, all this changes. What point does this change? It is when the white men come in. It is the representatives of the city ambulance. They come in. Uh, the city service, there is an ambulance. Uh, the ambulance comes in to take away the body. And uh, it is made uh, clear that this boy 
is actually uh, being taken away in a city ambulance and that these men who are coming are actually white men. And you can see an immediate change in the demeanor of the two people. They suddenly want to look good. There is a sudden concern from both the mother and the son about their physical appearance. Uh, there are critics uh, who have, McLaren especially, who have said that this is an instance of uh, them showing their racial pride. You know, when a white man is coming in, no, there shouldn't be any bickering and we should look nice. That kind of, even, uh, again, the macabre humor because the dead boy wants to look nice for the undertaker. And he says that, oh, please bring, bring me my comb and my stocking cap so that I can comb my hair and put my stocking cap on so that I can look very neat for the undertaker. What does the dead care for the appearance? Again, you could think that this concern for his appearance comes from the mother's guilt rather than from the dead son. So he wants to look decent for the undertaker. So after the body is taken away, you can see the mother. She wails like hysterically when the white men come in, but then she uh, settles down. You can see that the mother is triumphant and resilient. She does not do any kind of class analysis about her situation. She does not suddenly become a new woman. That doesn't happen. Uh, you have uh, the character of Lottie in Angelo Henderson Jones, another play, where Lottie has this recognition of the kind of uh, position she's in. But this woman is not going to become a new woman just because her son died or her circumstances has not changed at all. She does not have time to grieve. She goes back to prostitution. Now you can see that Hughes is not romanticizing prostitution, nothing like that. But he uses prostitution as a complex metaphor for both the survival of the mother and the betrayal of the dead son. And when she leaves, she smoothens the coat that you can see. Perhaps she's going out and she's going to bring a client, a man who's going to pay her for sex. Maybe she'll bring that man back to the same apartment and he will be lying with her in the very same bed where her son her son's body lay dead. So it is a very, these are different elements of the play that you could actually look into. So finally, when we finish with the play, uh, the questions that you must ask is this, um, is the mother a no good mama? No good mama is the term that the boy uses. Is she really no good? Uh, is that her fault? Again, who is the real culprit? Who is the person who put this woman in that kind of a position where she has no dignity? Is there a way out? Did this woman ever have a choice? Did this woman ever have an option? Could she have found something else in order to support her son? Nowhere is it mentioned that the woman is lazy. It, that is not the, the, even the son does not accuse her of being lazy. So it was it really her fault. So what story does the play tell about marginalized societies and their continued suffering? It is very easy to look at the play and see a bad mother and uh, you know, a son who has become victim of this bad parenting. But it is much, much more than that. Uh, the concept of parenting and what has to be done as a parent, uh, the, it is not just giving of food, it is also the inculcation of morals and manners. So these things, the woman has no idea about these things. How does it happen? How does a woman enter into uh, parenthood without any idea about what parenthood uh, entails. So these are the things, uh, the question of unplanned parenthood, a question of marginalized communities and how they are perceived. These are some of the things that you must look into when you are going into uh, the play in detail. If you can keep these things in mind, uh, I think the play will become more, much more enjoyable. There are several questions uh, that are given <coughs> towards the end of the uh, uh, chapter. Uh, there are exercises. Some of these questions require you to do some a uh, little amount of research. Some of uh, these questions are very easy. Uh, when you write about the play, uh, write a little more about the circumstances of the play. Uh, don't just go for the literal details of it and uh, I'm sure that uh, that will give you a new experience into what it means to be in a marginalized a society and how marginalized societies perceive normal, ordinary realities that we see around us.